people tend to go after these really, really small niches, which causes them to struggle to generate, create a business that generates a million, two million, five million, ten million. million. The biggest, that's the biggest mistake that I see people making. So if you can. Right off the bat, uh, you know, a lot of the guests listening uh, to the show um, are eager to get their business from, you know, 5 million to 10 million and eventually one day, a hundred million dollars revenue a year. You're someone that's already surpassed that hundred million revenue per year goal. You've done that for years now. I'm curious, like, how do you see the difference between a CEO and a founder and the role they need to play from getting to kind of one to $10 million revenue, then 10 to a hundred and then a hundred to a billion. How do you kind of see the core uh, skills they need to have the systems and the team they need to be building around them? So we're going to skip the hundred to a billion part. Cause I've never gone to a billion. So I don't, you know, whatever I tell you would just be a bunch of bull. Um, okay. I've done the others and zero to like 10 million a lot of it is going out there wheeling and dealing being scrappy you set up some operations you're just trying to go and capture money the reason most people struggle from zero to 10 isn't the processes or systems it's actually usually that they're in a niche so i like looking at something called tam total addressable market the bigger the market you're in the easier it is to go after like get to five or 10 million because people spend so much. For example, if you sold cars, I understand it costs a lot of money to make a car, but if you sold cars, cars will sell for a decent amount. It doesn't take long to generate 10 million in revenue when you're selling a car for $50,000, right? It, it's actually really fast. There's so many people that buy cars, everyone needs it. But on the flip side, I had a buddy who's just like, oh, I'm gonna end up selling croissant toast all right yes a lot of people buy croissants but the amount of people that want croissant toast like think of like a loaf of bread but made of croissant bread or you know however you want to describe it and you slice it up and you put it in the toaster and they're like yeah that's what we want to sell it's such a small niche people are going out there every day and be like man i need that loaf of bread that tastes like croissant it's more like a novelty item, it's not something that you buy every single day like you were just buying a normal um, loaf of bread from the grocery store. And then their cost to make it was through the roof. So when you think about that, it's too small of a niche. If you're just going to go after selling bread, sure, bread is a massive market. Rice is a massive market. There's money to be made there. But people tend to go after these really, really small niches, which causes them to struggle to generate, create a business that generates a million, two million, five million, ten million. 10 million. The biggest, that's the biggest mistake that I see people making. So if you can create a business in a big enough market, it's not that hard to get to 10 million. Now going from 10 to hundred, which was the next part of your question, a lot of it's systems and processes and people. And the key is you go on LinkedIn, look for people who work for your competitors, got multiple promotions. Because them getting multiple promotions means that the competitor found them valuable and they did a good job in most cases for them to get multiple promotions. And those are the people you want to hire to help you scale from 10 to 100 because they've already done it before in your space for your competition. And they've gotten multiple promotions, which means they've done a good job or else no one would keep promoting them unless that business is crazy. Right. And so beyond just people that have maybe worked for a couple of your competitors, been promoted, showing that like they they were legit there, they're the real deal. What other side of kind of, uh, you know, traits are you looking for in great people? Uh, you know, you've obviously been building businesses now for 20 years and, you know, you've hired, I'm sure unbelievable people given, you know, where your company's at and, you know, like all founders, we've hired some duds. Um, you know, what are some core things maybe that people don't look for that are some strategies that you've used to kind of acquire and, uh, bring on these amazing people. Look for people who are loyal, people who stick around at a company for a while because they're willing to put in the time and energy that's needed and willing to make the commitment. No one's going to fix your problems overnight or even in a year or two. It takes a long time. The second thing that I look for is people who have, uh, what is it called? I, I look for people who don't want to be entrepreneurs. So people who are entrepreneurs aren't meant to go work at a business for the rest of their lives. It's very hard to convince them to. I look for people who have been in a vertical for a long time and have relationships, whether it's relationships with banks or relationships with potential customers or relationships with other key employees. Um, I look for people 
who can bring people the moment they move, they switch companies because that means they're a great leader and people really value their opinion and they'll go wherever they are going. The other thing I look for is amazing managers, people who understand systems and processes and know how to lead. Uh, I look for people who are willing to be player coaches. That's really super important. We tell people that on our interviews. We don't want people just to manage others. We want people to help bring up others and manage, but at the same time, they got to get their hands dirty and go out there and go get bloody. And if they're not willing to do that, they're not a fit. Uh, We also look for people who believe work is life. Yes, you know, having a good balance is important in life, but if people love what they're doing and they're willing to put in more than 50, 60 hours a week, you're more likely to succeed. If someone believes that, oh, the work week should be nine to five and that's it and it ends there, you're not gonna be your competition. Yeah, I think that's a real controversial take too these days. You know, you have a lot of people that are looking for that sort of work-life balance and, you know, want to be able to check into the company nine to five and then be able to bounce and do their other things. You know, how do you, how do you kind of attract people that for them, you know, work is life? Um, You know, obviously, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk these days, like kind of like anti-hustle culture and, you know, finding balance. And, uh, you know, I think when you're building a company though, and when you're trying to achieve, you know, the company that you're trying to build here, a multi-billion dollar, you know, generational type brand and company, you know, you need people that are in it, that are real soldiers that are about the cause and that are going to give it everything they've got. Um, you know, how do you kind of throughout the interview process kind of field out the people that, um, are not about that? Yeah. So for me, um, I do think a work-life balance to some extent is still valuable. You don't want someone working 70 hours a week you know, every single week of the year, not taking Christmas or spending time with their family. There needs to be some sort of a balance. Some weeks you may only put in 40 hours or 50 hours. Some weeks you may have to put in 80 hours and just tough it out. You want people who are flexible and the way you usually find them is just being A, honest in the interview process, but B, culturally, it stops, it starts with the top. If the owners of a business or the leaders in a business aren't willing to put in the hours and the time, don't expect other people to. You lead by example. In terms of, you know, grow, you know, you're at this level now, you're, you know, growing a business now to a hundred million dollars plus revenue. I imagine you're pulling out of the business, you know, 50 to 80 million yourself. Like how has this like process now that you're building a business that's making that much money? Like, you know, how has your life changed, you know, and, and what is your kind of like daily schedule look like now that you're at this kind of level of business building? So I always joke with my team and I tell them I barely work. I tell them all you need to work a few hours a day. Um, But as my wife says, for someone who works a few hours a day, I tend to start at six in the morning and I tend to finish somewhere around nine at night. So my wife doesn't understand how I only work a few hours a day. And I do that almost seven days a week. Uh, And I also am traveling every single week for work as well. So I joke that I don't work too many hours, but in reality... Uh, I work a lot of hours. I just love what I do. So it doesn't seem like work. Like I'm doing a dinner meeting with someone today and trying to close a business deal. I don't see that as work. I don't count that as work. I just look at it as like, I'm going to dinner with a buddy that'll happen to hopefully we'll sign a deal right then and there. So for me, if it's fun, you know, you'll keep doing it and you won't worry about how many hours you put in. You'll just love it. Uh, But my schedule is flexible. For example, uh, my daughter has this thing at her school every other Friday where they go to like this auditorium and they do some ceremony thing. And, you know, kids do like little uh, dancing with their hands and stuff like that. If I'm in town, I go to it, right? That's what money provides. It provides flexibility on those kind of things. But from a time perspective, I do whatever it takes to win. Right. Now... In terms of, you know, you seem to be really clear on your values and also clear on, you know, you're enjoying what you do. I think that's an important thing when anyone's doing business, right? If you love what you do, you're genuinely passionate about it. What feels like work for others feels like play for you. That's a competitive advantage. That's going to help you stand out when others are getting burnt out or need a break. You know, you're just having fun. And I think you're a shining example of someone that's really embodying that, you know, you're having fun. It's proven through the results. You've built an amazing culture and you're making a real impact for your customers. I'm curious, like, what are your values when it comes to business? And, you know, why are you in the game still? Like, what kind of keeps you in the game? How do you cultivate that play, that fun um, on a daily basis? Yeah, so 
the values that just keep me in there, um, and, and there's a lot of them, right? Like for me, w at our company, we believe in being transparent. Um, we believe in continually becoming a better person and learning more. We continually believe in challenging ourselves and trying things that aren't always obtainable. Uh, but for us, it all comes down to, in reality, it's just like what stimulates you mentally. And for me, it usually is a goal or objective or a challenge. And that's what I tend to focus on. So then that way I want to wake up every day and do something. It's just like, I think business has the greatest sport ever. It's never ending. The scoreboard is always getting harder and harder to score on because there's always other people out there like the Elon Musk of the world that are just so much further ahead and props to him. I'm not trying to hate props to him for getting there. It's not like he was handed a silver spoon. He literally did it uh, without growing up with millions and millions of dollars. And, you know, he's still pushing the boundaries. But it's like for me, it's the scoreboard. And can you just win? Uh, my scoreboard is much different. I'm in the marketing vertical, so the companies are much smaller than what some of the other players are going after. Uh, they're still big. You know, a lot of them have 10 plus billion dollar market caps, but I just love what I'm doing. What is that kind of big challenging goal that you have for yourself right now? Like, what does that scoreboard look like for you over the next three years? I don't think I'll achieve it in three years. I think I can achieve it within 10, which is to be the largest ad agency in the world. That's my goal. Uh, from a digital side. So not traditional. Uh, we're not really focusing too much time on, hey, we're going to help you make television commercials when everything is shifting towards digital. And so when we were talking over the weekend, one of the strategies you brought up was this idea of going and either building or buying software and making it free, giving it away um, to go and attract, you know, hot leads and basically be able to build your business on the services side of things. I'm curious for founders that are looking to get from, you know, 2 million to 10 million uh, revenue a year. How do you think about kind of executing that strategy on like a step-by-step -step basis? Yeah. If you're looking to get to 2 million to 10 million, think of the market you're in and what software you can give for free that will get you more leads or customers for the main thing you're selling. So I'll give you an example. And I gave this in person uh, at the event. If you're selling health insurance, a lot of people who pay for health insurance are companies. So think about a free payroll software instead of charging for payroll software, which is what most people do, give it away for free and then sell a portion of those people on health insurance. That's an example of giving away something for free and then selling them on something else. So we're in the marketing space. We have an ad agency called NP Digital. We sell marketing services. A lot of people who need marketing services also use marketing software to help them with their paid ads and SEO, but a portion of them rather just hire people to do it for them. So we give away a lot of free marketing tools like Uber Suggest and Answer the Public, captures a lot of leads, and then from there our sales team sell them on services. And if you look at how much money people are spending on services versus software, I'll give you an example of this. You know, HubSwap may, may do around 1.2, 1.3, maybe 1.4 billion in revenue a year. I'm rounding. I, I know the number is more than a 1 billion. It's less than 2 million. Uh, chances are, as we're recording this interview, less than 1.5. And I'm not trying to knock HubSpot. That's a lot of revenue. And they've done an amazing job and built a great product. If you look at how much money is spent in the ad agency world, a lot of the Omnicoms, WPPs, a lot of those guys do 10 plus billion in revenue. Some of them do over 15 billion in revenue. That's a lot of cash. So give away the software for free where people spend less on software. They're spending more on services. And in exchange, it doesn't cost that much on the software end, but in exchange, you're getting a lot of users you're getting a lot of leads and a portion of them will buy your services. Right. And so how do you kind of think about the decision between build versus buy there? You know, like does someone go and look at a bunch of competitors or, or and look at a competitive space and the software tools that are in that and look to acquire a company for, you know, a million dollars cash or how do you kind of look at that? Or, you know, at what point are they just like, you know, I have this great idea. I've seen other software tools in this space that are, are doing it well or charging a hundred bucks a month, but I could just go pay a firm a hundred, 150 K to go and develop and design this for me. And I'll just undercut them and offer it for free. How do you kind of think about that? If you're enjoying this interview with Neil Patel, you would love the founder West newsletter in just three minutes a week, learn how to grow your audience brand and community. When you sign up, you're gonna get my free vision board system worth over $200 for free. So go sign up in the link in the description. Let's get it. Yeah. So I look at it as, uh, if you can end up 
going out there and buying someone who already has an audience and they're not making much money, uh, that's an easier solution. If you can't do that, go and build it. You can use uh, things like ChatGPT to build you tools. They can build you like a body mass index calculator if you're into health and fitness. Uh, they built the game Pong in less than 60 seconds. Someone was testing it out. I forgot who. And they had ChatGPT build a working version of Pong in less than 60 seconds. You can hire developers as well, but start off with ChatGPT and then plug in the developers to help fix it and fine tune it and make it the way you need. Yeah. Switching gears here to the content side of things, you know, I was reading your uh, blog, you know, when I was, I think, like 16 years old. I've been following you for, you know, better part of 15 years now or so. Uh, I'm curious, like, you know, in 2023, what do you think it takes to build remarkable content? grow an audience and really stand out, um, given just the pace at which the attention economy is growing, you know, the creator economy now is blowing up. Um, and there's more and more people coming online to building organic content. Um, you know, I was kind of shocked over the weekend, we were both at this event, and it must have been 98% of people, it seemed the core part of their business growth was all ads. And I couldn't help but think just how risky that is just to be completely addicted to the ad growth side of things when um, you know, when you're building content and you're putting it out there, you're truly building your own personal media empire around your personal brand and your business. I'm curious how you think about uh, building, you know, organic content and standing out in 2023. Yeah. So I look at that as uh, the same way as Google does double E A T also known as E uh, experience, expertise, authority, and trust. Everyone can create content. Like you can use chat GPT to create content. You can use the Uber says AI writer to create content. If everyone's using the same AI tools to create content, whether it's for social or text space, how are you going to stand out? Everyone's going to look like, where's Waldo? Remember that game from back in the day where like you would try to find Waldo because he would stand out wearing that striped red and uh, white striped shirt. But these days, everyone looks like Waldo and you got to find the people that look like you and me, which is really hard to do because everyone is just using the same tools and the same technology to create their content. So if you can create content that showcases your experience, or your expertise, or your authority and trust, you can end up bringing a whole new perspective to a topic. You're going to stand out and that's how you're going to build a community. That's how you're going to do well in the long run. But that's super hard to do for most people because they're not willing to just take out their phone and start recording. They're stuck in the ways of what's the fastest way to create content? What's the most automated way? It's not actually hard from a you know, mental standpoint, it's hard from it just takes time. Bust out your phone, start talking, break down stuff that only you would know, uh, or very few people would know, because it's something that you experienced or you've done in your uh, current life, while other people couldn't do this if they use AI to create content. So are there any examples online, you know, of different brands you're seeing or different people online that you're like, damn, that person's on like the bleeding edge of, you know, where uh, you know, online branding, audience growth, and like original content are kind of going. For a personal side, there's a guy named Alex uh, Hermosi, which is worth checking out. He's been doing some really cool stuff. Uh, there's another uh, person named Cody Sanchez. She's been doing a really good job as well. For sure. And in terms of, uh, you know, when you kind of look back on, you know, your career, you know, when you were younger, maybe getting going at like 20, 21, 22, what would you have yeah. told like your younger self, like, getting oh. started of, you know, maybe some key mistakes, you know, we've all been there, a bad partnership or a co-founder issue or what, whatever it may be. Right. Um, I know I certainly have had a host of mistakes that I would love to go back and change. Curious how you think about that. Focus. That was the biggest mistake I made. Tried doing too many things at once. Always trying to find a new shiny object to make money from instead of just focusing on the business, focusing on what I'm good at and just executing on that and everything else being a distraction. That's what I really wish. Um, I did a long, long time ago and I didn't, uh, it's not too late though. I'm 38 now, so I can focus now and which I have been doing over the last five years. The other big mistake is picking too small of a TAM. My first few companies were like niche businesses and I was like, oh, the riches are in the niches. I believe that's so true that, I mean, that's so false. It's like the opposite of being true. Uh, the riches are in big, massive markets and I wish I knew that. I think there was a quote from like one of the Google founders and I'm paraphrasing it here. It's something like if you can create something that people have to use each and every single day, you're onto like something big and I'm paraphrasing here and I'm probably butchering it. So I apologize to whichever Google founder created that quote. Uh, but I look at 
those two things is probably the reason I'm not much further along in my career. For sure. I know we both are people that believe, you know, in the power of personal brands. You know, you brought up Alex yeah. Hermosi, Cody Sanchez. Uh, you know, you've utilized your personal brand over the years as well to help you build multiple brands and successful businesses to the tune of, you know, you were talking about $10 million even you've helped bring in uh, to your existing business through the personal brand. Like, how do you think about leveraging, you know, your personal brand, the content around it to drive business? I think it's a great strategy. I don't know why more people don't do it. Kylie Jenner has done a great job. Rihanna has done a great job. There's more social content, but you can do it with blog content. I did it. Backlinko did it. His name is Brian Dean of backlinko.com. He eventually sold to SEM Rush. The possibilities are endless. Larry Kim ended up building a site called WordStream and blogged and built up his brand and he sold the company. I, I forgot the amount. It was public, maybe somewhere around $100 million. You can make a lot of money through personal branding and people take it for granted. And they think you can only do it in B2C, works well in B2B and B2C. Uh, again, you just need to go after a big market. Doing it in a small niche doesn't do that well. And in terms of, you know, you know a big value of yours, you talked about, you know, wanting to challenge yourself, continue to learn, to continually grow. I'm of the mindset as well. Like if you're not learning, you're dying. You know, it's important to kind of constantly be challenging yourself, finding new experiences, uh, new people, new books that just, you know, kind of bring you onto new ways of thinking um, and surrounding yourself with people also that are challenging you. I'm curious, uh, based on kind of where you're at, any books that have helped you or any key learnings you've gotten over the last kind of six months that really transformed your way of thinking? Um, and what do you feel like in terms of over the next year is like the next challenge, the next big like learning opportunity that you're really leaning into? Yeah, so no books in the last six months has changed the way I thought. Uh, there's a lot of good books out there. Um, from like Art of the Start by Guy Kawasaki, The Dip by Seth Godin, Principles by Ray Dalio. Those are all books that people should check out. For me, what I like doing is I like learning by just being on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. Research any topic that you're interested in, whether it's mindset, meditation, whether it's a new business idea or learning about an industry or just learning about history. You can find all this stuff online, digest it super quick, and you can keep moving on onto the next topic that you you're interested in learning about. And if you find something that intrigues you, double down on it. But that's what I would say in which people can learn a lot just from the web, just from social. You can literally find almost anything on YouTube and learn there. You don't need to go to college. If you want to be a doctor, I understand some professions is required, but just go on YouTube and learn. And what do you think is kind of one of the bigger sort of hidden opportunities right now, 2023, moving to 2024 from a sort of marketing, audience growth, content standpoint? Sure. So one of the big hidden opportunities, and this will answer also part of your last question, because I believe you also asked, what am I trying to learn over the next six months? For me, I'm trying to learn quite a bit uh, about AI. Uh, and I think that's where also a lot of the opportunities is going to be in the future. When I'm talking about AI, like Terminator, the movie cell, I'm talking about AI in which how can you automate a lot of systems and processes and make the world just much more efficient place. And AI should help a lot of businesses do that. And as humans, if we push away AI, I believe what's going to happen is you're going to get replaced. But if you embrace it, you'll be more in demand because companies will be looking for people who understand how to use AI and how to integrate it within their systems and processes. And based on your research there so far, I know, you know, we're beyond the stage of just, you know, prompting chat GPT. That's kind of what you're seeing online. Everyone talking about that kind of more rudimentary stuff. But, you know, now we have the invention of things like auto GPT, one of the most viral projects right now on GitHub. I'm curious, where do you kind of see it affecting some of your businesses? Are there specific systems that you see it kind of taking to the next level and helping automate and make it easier first? Yeah, like analytics is a great example. Imagine or let's go back. How many companies spend billions of dollars a year, or hundreds of millions on advertising? A lot. Just look at Google's market cap, Facebook's market cap. Imagine instead of people analyzing analytics once a week or once a month and try to draw insights and figure out what to change. Imagine if in real time, AI was helping flag where there's waste and where things are going really well and sends it to a human and then you can click some buttons and then reallocate money. There would be such there'd be a much better ROI in a lot of marketing campaigns. We see this all the time. We see companies who are spending millions and millions and millions of dollars a month. And we go to them and we're like, oh, you don't look at your analytics here, here, and here. We should adjust this. And like, wow, we got over a 60% increase in ROI and still spending the same amount of money. 
Well, that's great, but you went two years without that. Imagine how much money was wasted over the last two years. Right. So yeah, that analytics side of things, yeah, is, a, is one big opportunity. Is there anything else you see it kind of disrupting in your sphere or in the marketing space that you know you're paying close attention to? At the creative. So in advertising, creatives is one of the biggest pieces of leverage. AI can help you crank out a thousand versions of creative and you can end up seeing what's converting better. And then you can go in there and fine tune the ones that work the best manually. That's going to be a huge disruption. Uh, another one is going to be systems and processes. There's a lot of mundane tasks that people are doing, like exporting, crunching numbers and creating reports. A lot of that could be done with AI. Uh, in SEO, you're going to see AI do a lot of the on-page changes over time. Um, because AI can even start creating code, right? Why can't it just go and fix the issues and then you just double check as a human and then upload the changes? Yeah, now, I've been playing a lot around a lot with uh, Mid Journey and uh, okay. feeding it different prompts, playing around with different things, whether it's for social or thumbnails and uh, things like different graphics for my blog. Uh, and it's, yeah, it's crazy just to see uh, the potential of where it's at and to think that, you know, it's it's really compounding at an insane rate as well. It'd be you know, crazy to see, yeah, how on not just the system side, the process side, but also on the creative end of things, how disruptive this new technology is going to be. I'm curious as like, you're kind of like, you know, you work with tons of founders, you've been a founder now for 20 years. What are some of like the most common mistakes that you're seeing people make these days uh, when it comes to looking to grow their brand, grow their audience online? The big mistake is them not using all the channels. They're like, oh, I love TikTok. I love it. So use all the channels. Don't be relying on one. The second one is they're not consistent enough. They'll post content, they'll get some traction, they'll post some more, they don't get the traction they're looking for the next week, and they just stop being consistent. It really is about being consistent. The third thing is looking at their analytics, seeing what's hitting for you and your competition, learning from it to give you ideas on what you should be doing to build up the audience. The fourth one is responding to your community and building one. A lot of people have comments and they're getting engagement from social, but what they're not doing is they're not responding to people engaging and building those relationships. I don't understand why. Um, but those are some of the big mistakes that we're seeing people make when it comes to building their brand. Right. And so when you think about like yeah, consistency, I think where a lot of founders get caught up is in this kind of content hamster wheel. You know, they're, they're trying to create content for multiple platforms. Oftentimes like they have a good idea maybe of what they want to create. Um, but you know, they're just falling behind. They're trying to make a TikTok one day, long form YouTube the other, and quickly feel like they're just simply drowning in the level of content they need to be making. Based on your experience, like what systems do you think are important to have in place and also the mindset to have in place to get off that content hamster wheel and build a sustainable sort of audience growth system around you? Gary Vaynerchuk has a content repurposing framework uh, that was online. I'm pretty sure it's still online. Go and follow it. So for example, if you have a long form video, you don't have to create the short form. You can slice and dice the long form and make short forms out of this. Even before this podcast interview, I'm like, hey, send me the recording and we'll plug you and we'll put it online. Why? Because my team can slice and dice, make long form from it. They can make short form from it. They can even transcribe some of the stuff I'm saying and create a blog post from it. I can take some of the things and turn it into mini podcast episodes. It's endless, but I'm taking one longer piece of content and making tons of smaller pieces of content versus creating a long piece of content, then five small pieces, and then writing a blog post, and then recording a podcast. Like you can do it all at once. Yeah, no, I'm big on that. There's kind of like a content waterfall and you have, yeah, your pillar piece of content could be something like a podcast like this and being able to kind of, like you said, slice and dice that into your TikToks, your IG Reels, your YouTube Shorts, you know, shorter form YouTube videos. And then, yeah, translating that to to uh, text as well, whether Twitter, LinkedIn, carousels, you know, et cetera. It's kind of yeah, being efficient and mapping out first things first, that whole kind of content system and waterfall so that you're getting the most bang for your buck and you're able to get off that content hamster wheel and scale your time and buy it back. I'm curious on the analytics side of things, you know, there's a lot of different tools that I use to kind of find, you know, the most viral content out there from others, whether it's using tools like Twemex on Twitter, Taplio on LinkedIn, um, and finding kind of what content's really rising on those platforms. Are there any tools that you like to use to kind of find you know, what competitors are putting out there in your space and what's really popping off in your kind of like marketing niche and then translating that to how you then think about your own content strategy. So you already mentioned a lot of the good tools out there. The other one I would add is Social Blade. So then you can look at people's follower accounts and see who's growing the fastest. That'll give you an idea of whose content's resonating the most. So not just who's getting views, but what piece of, who's creating content that's resonating, that's causing people to actually want to follow them, hence building a community. Uh, and then follow those people as well. 
and look at their content and learn from it. Is there some sort of like, I've used Social Blade and I'm also oftentimes looking at others and looking at you know my own growth day to day. And I'm curious, is there some sort of like leaderboard as well in Social Blade or something where you can see rising stars or you know people Not that are trending or you just have to go kind of like one by one and input their information into Social Blade? One by one, input their information. Uh, and what I also like doing too is I like looking at ants with the public. 15% of all Google searches have never been searched before. Just think about that for a minute. There's billions of searches. 15% have never been searched before, even though Google's been around 20 plus years. It tells you what's up and coming right now before it's competitive. The other one that I like looking at is Brian Dean had, I'll actually look it up right now, uh, uh, Exploding Topics. Yep. Topics. Yeah. So that's another one. I'm like, I'm forgetting the name. I don't know why I was blanking on the name. <laughs> But it's showing you what's up and coming and what's booming right now. And that's really cool too. These two tools will help you come up with ideas on what to create your content around that people are curious about, but a lot of people aren't necessarily uh, have talked about before. How do you think about the balance? Like I think a lot of founders struggle with like, there's these topics that we can find on platforms like Exploding Topics, Twemex, Taplio, Social Blade, let's say, that we know have viral potential that people are searching for and that they really care about. On the other side of things, from our own customers, we're hearing what matters to them, what their problems are, and that more sort of like high purchase intent, high problem intent type keywords and topics. How do you kind of balance that? Uh, or how do you think about that balance between you know more, these more like growth and trending subjects and then more of the subjects that are the real problems that your customer's having? And, and kind of how do you think about that as you're building your content strategy? So marketing, you have top of funnel, stuff that really just gets eyeballs. And you have middle of funnel, people may be doing research and they're interested in products in your space. And then you have bottom of funnel, people are just like ready to make that transaction like you were talking about. Your goal should be to create content for all three of those buckets. You can do a one third, one third, one third split and create content that resonates with everyone. That way you're continually building a new audience, you're nurturing that audience, and then you're converting that audience. But you need all three because the top of funnel just allows you to get more and more people. No, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, you need that kind of top of funnel stuff just to kind of widen the funnel and get the growth going and that organic traction. And then, yeah, kind of push them through uh, with more intent-based uh, keywords and topics uh, and kind of strike that balance. I'm curious, like, there's a lot of uh, founders I work with, creators I work with, they've gotten their, you know, email list, their newsletter to, you know, around that like 50,000 subscriber range. Um, but they have ambitious goals of getting to, you know, 500K, a million, like folks like James Clear, The Hustle, and what Morning Brew's done. Uh, you know, they're typically using platforms like Beehive or ConvertKit. And, you know, they're, they've gotten to a good stage, but they're looking to kind of now bring it to the stratosphere. I'm curious, like, how do you think about growing a newsletter from that 50K range to the million, like to a million people? The easiest way is give away free tools. And you give away free tools, and we talked about software earlier. You can get people to opt in to continually use your free tools, which will just cause your list size to explode. That's what we do. That's how we are list sizes over a million. Right. Yeah, no, I saw over the weekend, you were saying that your list size is growing at something like 286,000 people a month, I believe, if I, if I saw that right. So yeah, the free tool side is definitely one big unlock. I'm curious, are there, so that's, that's definitely one. Is there anything else that founders can be thinking about in terms of growing their list um, or a lo any lower weight strategies than obviously building out a tool can take some time. Opt-ins, free eBooks, free guides, driving paid traffic to a blog. Uh, but we haven't found really any of the other strategies to be anywhere near as effective as just giving away free tools. Probably not the answer that most people want to hear, but it's the truth. Right. And so when you think about that, like kind of like a free tool to grow an email list, like does it need to be some big robust tool from your standpoint? Or are there any sort of like more sort of like, is there, when you, how do you think about kind of building maybe a lean tool then to grow a subscriber list? Sure, so the easiest way is you go to codecanyon.net. There's tools in almost every space. You can white label them. You can buy it for probably less than 50 bucks, usually 10, 20, $30. Pop those on your site and go from there. That's where I would say is a huge opportunity for most people. That way you can get something that has a little bit more than the bare minimum of features. That way it's more than a minimal viable product, but you don't have to spend that much time building it at all. Yeah. Um, switching gears here to kind of the mentor side of things, like over the course of my career, I'd say like 80% of my success has been learning from people that are way smarter than me, understanding their systems, their approaches to hiring, you know, what mistakes they made and then translating those learnings to my current businesses to take them from where they are to where I'm looking to go. 
and avoid a lot of the pitfalls and mistakes that, um, that they've kind of taught me to avoid. I'm curious from where you're at right now, getting into this kind of hundred million dollar per year range to, you know, a billion and being the most dominant digital marketing advertiser in the world. I'm curious, what are some mentors that you're surrounding yourself with right now? And, and how do you look at kind of, um, building out your, uh, right kind of like, you know, personal board of advisors to take you from where you are to where you're looking to go. Yeah. So, uh, I don't look at mentorship as like, how can I surround myself with amazing people? Uh, that would be great, but sometimes it's hard to do because we all live in different places. Like I think right now you're in what Median. Yeah. Yeah. And it's hard to do that when you're traveling, you may not speak the language. You may not know a ton of people. I'm in Las Vegas. Uh, so building my network here. What I love doing is a going to conferences because you can meet people uh, in all parts of the world, just like how we met at a conference, actually two conferences now. And the other thing I love doing is just learning from YouTube videos. It's amazing on how much you can learn by just watching other people's videos and gaining the knowledge without actually knowing them. And that's provided a ton of mentorship for me over the years. And uh, in terms of like, you know, your own like productivity, your own happiness, you know, uh, curious, like, are there any kind of core purchases when you look back over the last like year or two that really like, helped, uh, helped you in a big way that you're like, damn, that was a great purchase. That's something that like, I'm very, uh, I'm grateful for. I can't really think of like a purchase that's really changed my life. Having a driver has helped a lot. I can focus more on just work. Uh, yep. I hate purchasing homes. That's probably one of the bigger mistakes I've made. Uh, I would not recommend homes. I'd rather just use a cash to grow a business, uh, to each their own though. But I would probably say drivers really helped streamline life, make it more efficient. I can work even when I'm in the car. So that's been cool. Yeah, the driver side of things definitely on the on the, on the goals list. I'm tur curious, why, why do you think kind of uh, buying a home has been a waste? I, I hear this from a lot of people actually that, you know, they it was a big dream of theirs. Founders had a big exit, goes and finally invests in his dream home. And later, like a year or two after, it's like, damn, like I should have just kept Airbnb and traveling the world. Like, I don't know, this thing's just become a nuisance. Like, explain that to me. Like, why... Uh, What's your thinking there? Homes always have problems, leaky roofs, gardens, issues, maintenance. Even if it's a new home, they still have problems. I've had new homes built with leaky roofs. Uh, if you just take that money, like everyone's like, oh, my home's building all this equity. I'm making all this money. You got a mortgage. Well, if you just take the mortgage and you give it to rent and you take your 20% down and you invest it in business, I found that if you're good at what you do, and I recommend people bet on themselves, you typically will come ahead more than if you bought that home. It's not like the home's going to appreciate like crazy in value. Yeah. We're both believers in this kind of concept of done is better than perfect. I see a lot of founders, they get caught up in sort of overanalyzing things, uh, getting lost in perfectionism and ends up just kind of making them feel stuck. Everything gets delayed um, and versus, uh, you know, a focus on speed and getting things out there. They're just kind of falling behind. I'm curious, you know, as you're kind of building companies, how do you think about that balance between building something that's quality and, and building things for speed. Um, how do you kind of foster that on your team? So everyone's a little bit different. I optimize for speed. I'm all about the quick and dirty. And if something's working, then work on making it great and amazing and perfect. But I'm all about the quick and dirty and just getting stuff out there. Uh, I, I don't need it perfect. I'm okay with things not being perfect. I just want the results. And if it's, you know, all taped together and tied up with some shoestring and some glue to make it work, but it's providing the results, cool, then I'll go make it perfect and remove the tape and the shoestrings and the glue and make it amazing and people love it. But I want to make sure it's producing the results first. Yeah. Now that's one of my biggest pet peeves is when I'm talking with someone and they've got an amazing thing and they keep on saying they're going to launch it on Monday, but then Monday, Tuesday comes along and they're just yeah. like, oh, you know, I just needed to make this a little better. Don't feel quite comfortable yet, but I'm looking at the product. I'm like, damn, this thing's amazing already. Like ship this thing. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious, like any other kind of pet peeves on your side, uh, when it comes to the marketing space and building a business that you constantly are seeing and you're like, damn, like, why are we doing that? Uh, the other thing is pet peeve is people not generating revenue quick enough. Everyone's like, oh, we got to have all these things. Then we can end up going out there and making money. I'm like, well, have you tried selling it? Have you tried asking people to pay for it? Go and collect some money. Someone's probably willing to and get feedback and then go adjust from there. I think people wait way too long before they try to collect revenue. Yeah, no, I see that all the time too. And I see one of the biggest misconceptions there is that too early on founders think that, oh, I need to hire a head of sales and I need to build a sales team. 
when it's like, no, you need to get out there and start selling this thing yourself, getting real market feedback, talking to real customers, and then implementing their feedback on the product and just getting the deal across the finish line. I'm curious as you're kind of building out companies, how do you see that balance between the founder selling the product and at what point does it make sense to then start building out a team? Once you figure out the process, if you don't, if you're not willing to sell it, how can you go hire someone and tell them, Hey, this is how you do it. When they, you've never done it yourself. You need to go there, sell it, experience the ups and the downs and the objections and figure out what processes and frameworks you need to use to make this repeatable and then go hire someone and then go train them. And, uh, one thing, uh, more of a personal side, currently, uh, building out, uh, founderwest.com about to launch a new Webflow blog there. Uh, be the de facto spot for founders to find systems to scale their businesses to $5 million plus. How do you kind of think about the keyword research around a subject like that and building out like a good, solid, organic traffic infrastructure for a website? Yeah. So I look at the keyword infrastructure as you need to do your keyword research. You can use tools like Ubersus to do that or answer the public. And you can even put in your competitor URLs and it shows you all their popular pages, all their popular keywords that each page ranks for. And what you want to do is look at the keywords that have a high CPC and volume. High CPC means someone's willing to spend a lot of money for that keyword from an ad perspective. So if a keyword has high volume and a high CPC, it usually means it's a money keyword. It's a keyword that can drive revenue. And then you can look at your competitor sites using Ubersess, see what pages and content they're creating around those keywords. And then you can map out, all right, if I want to get a lot of traffic, what are the pages that I need to create the topics and what keywords do I need to include in each of those pages? And Ubersess will show you all that for free. Damn, you make it uh, you make it sound so easy. So yeah, Uber suggest uh, answer the public. I'm curious, are there any other marketing tools you started using recently that you're like, damn, this is a hidden gem? You know, I wish I had known about this sooner. Mid journey, although it may, may not be considered a marketing tool. Do you consider marketing right. marketing creative tool? I don't know what it's considered. I guess just like yeah, your intent in using it. Yeah, if you're looking to use it for marketing creative ads and such, then yeah, it's a marketing tool. And uh, I'm curious, like on your on your personal side, you're a guy that's like traveling a lot. You're exploring the world. I'm very similar, you know, I came to a point kind of eight years ago where I knew I really wanted to travel, like explore the world. And I had always seen life as this trade off. I either build a successful business in one place um, or I travel and live my dreams. Um, and there came a point where I just kind of had to look myself in the mirror and go like, well, why not both? Why yeah. not travel the world, live my life, explore new cultures, meet new people, live the life of my dreams and form my business, my work, my career around what makes me passionate. How do you kind of think about that? You're obviously traveling the world. You have two kids. You got a home base in Vegas. You got another home in Beverly Hills. Like, how do you kind of balance like the 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 love of travel and exploring new places and meeting new people and and build your business around that? Well, I, I travel. I'm on the road for call it 35 weeks out of the year. So for me, I already had to travel for work. So I get to experience new things, meet new people, see new cultures, uh, and. I think it's great. Like you're heading to Japan, if I'm not mistaken, in a few weeks, right? Yep. yep. So it's like, it's cool. You're in Colombia right now. You're going to be in Japan in a few weeks. It's great. Experience new things, new food, new culture. I don't understand why people can't do both. It does get harder when you have kids and they're in school, but you can also homeschool kids and travel the world. There's a guy named Jermaine Griggs. I don't know if he still does it, but he did that for a while. That was a really cool concept. I think kids can get amazing education doing that versus just being stuck in a classroom. And as you're traveling, like, is there something that's kind of stood out as, you know, I know over the years from traveling, as I've kind of uh, experienced new cultures, experienced new things, one of my big learnings has been like, you know, people are great all over the place, you know, and the more you just kind of put good energy out there into the world, you know, the more it kind of like comes back and people yeah. genuinely, they want to help you, you know, it doesn't matter what culture you're in, you know, you give to people, you help people out. Um, you know, reciprocity is a universal language. I'm curious, you know, amongst your travels, like are there any kind of core learnings that really stand out as insights you've gleaned that have kind of maybe changed your philosophy on life? The big thing that has changed my philosophy in life that I learned from traveling is there's a lot of basic necessity type of businesses out there that just make a ton of money. <laughs> you know, being raised in California, I thought, oh, tech is where everything is, Silicon Valley. And I'm not trying to knock Silicon Valley. There's a lot of innovation there, but we tend to forget there's a lot of big businesses in the basics. People need rice. I was reading an article a few weeks ago. There's a shortage of rice. You know how much money there is just selling rice or how much money there is 
uh, removing dirt. One of my buddies has a dirt moving company and it just moves it. People do construction. What do you do with that dirt? Or what, what do people do with the garbage? What do people do with, you know, HVAC, like heating and air conditioning? All these homes in some places is really cold. Some people in places is really hot. We forget how much money there is in basic necessity type of businesses. And traveling has really opened my eyes to it because you meet a lot of entrepreneurs who are really well off. And most of them, their businesses are in basic necessities. And it's not like something cool. Like I created a Facebook and sure, these guys aren't as rich as Mark Zuckerberg, but they've done really well just doing basic, boring, old school businesses that we all take for granted. Yeah, no, I see that all the time too. We're always looking for that, like that next shiny toy, that cool tool that, you know, all our friends are going to be impressed with that we invented this thing. And then you, yeah, as you're traveling around, you're at different masterminds, different conferences, you just see these people that are just absolutely killing it off the most unsexy, just boring, basic ideas. But yeah, they're necessities that people use in everyday lives. And, you know, they're what kind of really can generate some serious market value and, and serve a ton of people. So, um, I'm curious, like on your side too, I talk to a lot of founders all the time, you know, I think, feel like, like 80% of the battle sometimes is you're building a business. It's not the business itself. Oftentimes as a founder, it's just your own mindset, your own sort of like mental health, mental fitness. Um, you know, you're someone that's working like 70, 80 hours a week, which for a lot of people is like a marathon. Um, a lot of the founders I speak with, you know, sometimes they feel stuck. They feel overwhelmed, depressed, anxious, you know, they're many people are running a business that's running them into the grounds. Uh, I'm curious, like, as you've been building your business, how do you kind of, you know, when I, when I see you, uh, whether it's like at the conferences we've been at or online, uh, you know, you're always someone that I think has like a really infectious, playful energy. Uh, you light up the room, you hey. know, you can tell that you're just genuinely having fun. Um, you view work as play. Um, and I feel like you bring almost like an inner child kind of energy to the conversations that you have, the relationships around you. Um, and someone that really stands out to me as like, you're just here to help people. You're just here to have some fun. And you seem to have this very light, energetic approach to building companies. I'm curious your advice to those founders that maybe are finding that they're in a bit of a lull, they're taking things too seriously. And how do they kind of lighten it up a little bit? Love what you're doing. If you love what you're doing, you typically will have a much more playful attitude and also take breaks every once in a while. And whether it's go play at a park with your children or go play a game of basketball with your friends. If you do things that you genuinely enjoy, you're just going to be in a better mood, especially when you work. And if you love what you're doing while you work, it also helps you be in a better mood. Do you, I'm curious, like I know a lot of founders that, you know, they think about either buying something when they hit a certain milestone or maybe like taking some awesome adventure when they hit some sort of big goal. Uh, you know, I'm kind of currently getting a bunch of my business on autopilot, getting a bunch of systems offloaded, bringing on a couple more operations people, and then, you know, piecing off to Japan to go on a big <laughs> adventure, um, and, uh, putting myself in a really uncomfortable time zone so that the business just has to kind of run on autopilot in the new ways I'm kind of automating. I'm curious, like, how do you kind of think about, uh, you know, rewarding yourself for, you know, things well done? Yeah, and I haven't done the Japan thing, a different time zone thing. Uh, technically, I have, uh, but I have CEOs and stuff who run the business, so I, I don't really have uh, that issue. But from a reward perspective, I used to try to buy things. Like, I have Patek Philippe's, like the watches. Don't really wear any of them. Um, bought cars, bought a Maybach uh, a long time ago. Uh, just sold it during COVID, bought the new Maybach, I think, last February when the new model came out. Um, but I don't really buy much and the new buy box, it wasn't like a reward at that point. I was just used to, it. and I was like, oh, a new one's out. I don't have one. Want a driver again. Everyone's going out and about and got another car and got a driver again. But, the uh, rewarding, like the watches and stuff like that doesn't really make me happy anymore. Giving and helping other people out. That's helped out a lot. That's, uh, put me in a really good mood uh, seeing, you know, other people have a smile on their face because you helped them. That's been one of the biggest rewards of making money as an entrepreneur for me. My wife, you know, focuses 100% of her time to help others. I think that's great. I'm not as, you know, as amazing of a person as my wife. So I focus on making money. She spends the time giving it away and uh, we make a great combo. But that really makes me happy to see other people come up in life because our checks help. And we don't really make that much of an impact compared to like an Elon Musk or Bill Gates or any of those guys who can really donate money. But 
we try to do whatever's in our means. Is there like a moment in your life that you feel like your mindset sort of shifted around that where you're like, you know, I feel like this next watch or this car is going to bring me a level of happiness. And then you maybe had bought that thing and you're like, no, you know what? Like my, my mindset's now shifted on this. This actually maybe didn't bring me any more happiness. It just brought me more problems. Yes. Uh, not really problems, but it shifted for me the moment I started buying more watches and it would be, I would be happy for a few days. Like, oh, okay. What's next? Now, like if I buy a car, it's like, whatever, I got a car. I don't even care. I got a legit car back from my dad. We used to have a Honda Odyssey. My dad took it for a few months, gave it back to us because we needed it for our kids. And like, I love driving that thing. That's awesome and amazing. So when I'm not getting driven around, uh, and when I get driven around, by the way, like we have a Lincoln Navigator that a driver also drives like as a family car. Even if he's driving me in the Lincoln Navigator, and it's just him and me. I sit in the front seat so we can converse and stuff like that. And I'm like, oh, how's your kids and wife? And he'll tell me stories. Um, but yeah, it's just, I don't know. And all this materialistic stuff doesn't make me happy. Even our house in Beverly Hills, my wife and I are debating just getting rid of it. Had it for a year and a half and we haven't spent any time in it. It's like, might as well get rid of it and donate the money or use it for something else. I don't want to buy another home. I'd rather just donate the money. Love it. Well, um, you know, this has been a lot of fun and I appreciate all the insights uh, over the weekend and here uh, today on the show. Um, appreciate all you're doing to give back to the community and, uh, you know, sharing all the knowledge you've done to build, uh, you know, an incredible business, incredible brand. And so I uh, want to thank you for taking the time today and excited to, uh, to do following your journey and seeing uh, you build up the most valuable digital marketing agency in the world. I'm going to try. Thanks for having me. A lot of people that I work with, a lot of the founders I'm working with in Founder OS, oftentimes come to me with this kind of self-limiting belief, thinking that there's a trade-off in life between, you know, you either sort of do what you love to do, but have to sacrifice getting paid for that, or you, you know, do what you can be paid for, but you're not going to enjoy it. And 